The de Broglie relation and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle are going to be the two topics we cover in this brief lesson, and we'll find out that de Broglie is my favorite person from all of chemistry history, as we'll see, and, uh, and then we'll cover exactly what you need to know about the de Broglie relation as well as the Heisenberg uncertainty principle for a typical general chemistry course. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. In addition to high school and college science prep, we also offer prep courses for the MCAT, the DAT, and the OAT. You can find those courses at chadsprep.com. Now, this lesson is part of my new general chemistry playlist. I'm releasing several a week throughout the school year, so if you want to be notified every time I post one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. Let's dive into this here. So. Got to talk about the de Broglie relation here. And again, de Broglie is pretty much my favorite character from all of chemistry history. So de Broglie was uh, getting his PhD and he went to submit his PhD thesis. And if you know anything about this one, uh, they're usually on the order of like 50 to 100 pages long, these lovely PhD theses. And, uh, and they also grill you. So their goal is to make you feel dumb, not really. So, but their goal is to actually assess what you exactly know. And so what they usually do is they, they try to, you know, it's kind of like shooting cannonballs at your enemy. You, you shoot short and then you shoot long and then you kind of zero in right where they are. And so what they'll do is they'll ask you an easy question they think you should know. And then they'll ask you a really hard question that they probably think you probably don't know. Uh, and if you don't know that's coming, you're going to try and figure out how to answer it, and, and it rattles a lot of people. Uh, and by, you know, kind of undershooting you and overshooting you, then it can start narrowing in on what exactly you know. But it's a pretty grueling process. You know, you're sitting in front of a, a panel of, you know, distinguished professors who in all likelihood know way more than you do. Well, that was not the case with Mr. De Broglie. So he submitted his PhD thesis, and it was like a single page long, and, and it was involving this. And uh, essentially, you know, we, we talk about the de Broglie relation, and he said, well, if light can have both wave-like and particle-like properties and behavior, well, then why can't matter? So, and we always think of matter as just particle-like, but it turns out, he said, well, we should also view matter as being wave-like, and he said that we can calculate a characteristic wavelength for matter according to this equation. H here is Planck's constant, M is the mass of whatever particle you're looking at, and then V is its velocity. So, and it turns out that for big things, you're not going to find it, but for little things like electrons, we actually can measure their wavelength, and it turns out he was right, and they didn't have the tools to figure out that he was right right then, uh, and, and as a result, his professors on his thesis panel, his PhD panel, had no idea what to make of his thesis, and so they sent him out of the room, and they conversed and said, you know what he's talking about? No, I don't know what he's talking about. You know what he's talking about? And they didn't know, and so what they did is they just said, we'll get back to you, Mr. De Broglie, we'll get back to you. And so they sent his thesis off to Mr. Einstein and said, hey, what, can you, what do you make of this? And Einstein says, give the man his PhD, quit horsing around, and then send him to me. And so it turns out, you know, he was smarter than his PhD advisors in this case, his panel. So uh, great story from history. So but this is the relation, and a couple things you should take away from this lovely equation is, is one, that the wavelength is inversely proportional to the object's mass and inversely proportional to its velocity. So as mass or velocity go up, the wavelength is going to go down. And so notice, I am a particle, and so I have a wavelength. You can kind of see it, no. So the idea is that I'm too fat. I have way too much mass to see my corresponding wavelength. But for something as small as an electron, you can actually measure its wavelength and you know, corroborate that Mr. de Broglie got it right. In fact, we can use the wavelength of an electron uh, to actually map you know, the positions of atoms and things like this sort in different systems. So uh, super handy, super helpful. Uh, electron diffraction is what it's called. And so in this case, though, we're going to do a, a quick calculation here. We're going to calculate the wavelength of a one kilogram baseball traveling at 50 meters per second. That's going to be the question here. And so we're going to take the Planck's constant, same Planck's constant we've been dealing with for a couple lessons now. So 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. And for those that didn't see the last couple lessons, this is not typically a constant we make students memorize. It's usually one that they're provided with. So, but if your professor makes you, my apologies. So then we've got a one kilogram baseball here. That's the SI unit for mass, it turns out. And velocity here we said was 50 meters per second, which is, I don't know, probably on the order of somewhere, you know, like 90 miles an hour or something like that. So like a, a good fastball or something like this. And so we're going to calculate out this wavelength now and see why it is we don't actually experience it. So 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 divided by 1 and divided by 50 gets us a wavelength of 1.33.
times 10 to the negative 35 meters. And this is the problem we have. This is so small that we don't have anything on planet Earth that could measure a wavelength this small. Your eyes definitely can't detect it. Uh, for sure, but we don't even have a device that could measure this. And that's why for, you know, large objects that we deal with in the macro world, do they have a wavelength? In all likelihood, they do. They're just so small, they can't be detected. But for something like an electron, which instead of weighing one kilogram, weighs like 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms, it's so small that all of a sudden it's going to work out to being, when you divide by that small number, you end up with a wavelength that can actually be measured, that's actually detectable, and we can corroborate de Broglie's relation. So now we're going to talk about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And ultimately what Mr. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says is that the uncertainty in, in an elect the object we're talking about here is electrons typically, but the uncertainty in electrons position, X stands for position, so delta here stands for uncertainty. The uncertainty in its position times the uncertainty in its momentum, P here stands for momentum, is greater than or equal to a constant, in this case, h over four pi, or sometimes expressed as h bar over two, if you care, uh, and you probably don't. So Heisenberg also has some interesting history. I, I once read a book called The Catcher Was a Spy, and it was about a uh, former major league catcher who uh, during World War II was a spy, and he claims he was hired. He was a, actually a fairly uh, well-read and smart guy himself, but he claims he was hired to go uh, behind enemy lines and talk to Mr. Heisenberg and kind of probe him out because Mr. Heisenberg was hired by, uh, I shouldn't say hired, he was tasked, ordered by Hitler for the atomic bomb project for the Nazis during World War II. And, and he was supposed to probe Mr. Heisenberg here and find out how close they were. And his claim, this catcher, our former major league catcher, uh, his claim was that he was, you know, supposed to probe Mr. Heisenberg, and if he was close, he was supposed to kill him. So whether or not that's true, I have no idea. Mr. Heisenberg, it turns out, wasn't close, and some people think that Mr. Heisenberg was uh, on purpose uh, not being close, uh, and I'd like to think so. He was a brilliant guy, so uh, they tasked an absolute brilliant scientist with their atomic bomb project, so I like to think, hey, yeah, he was definitely not wanting to help Hitler is my, my wish, if you will. So... Uh, but our uncertainty principle here, big thing you got to know, is the two parts to this. And this can be expressed in a couple other ways, but this is the one you're most likely going to be tasked with in a general chemistry class. But the uncertainty in the position times the uncertainty in the momentum is greater than or equal to a constant. And so uh, you should understand what this kind of means. And so, uh, you know, the idea is that, you know, we're going to not be able to simultaneously know both the location, the position of an electron and it's momentum. And notice momentum is mass times velocity. And so the mass of an electron is not really changing, but the velocity is changing. And, and part of that velocity is how fast it's moving and what direction it's going. And so in this case, you can't simultaneously know with infinite precision, so infinite certainty, if you will, where an electron is and where it's going and how fast and stuff. So that's kind of what this says. And, and it turns out the better you know where it is, then the less you're going to have to know where it's going. So if you have a lower uncertainty in its position, well, then you're going to have to have a higher uncertainty in its momentum because that's the minimum value right there. And so the better you know where an electron is, the less you know where it's going. And the more you know where it's going, well, then the less you know where it is. It's kind of this funky conundrum. And, and there's a couple different ways to think about it, but that's ultimately the level that, that you need to know it. And again, the keywords here are position and momentum. And maybe you've got to do some basic calculation here and you might be given uh, you know, either the uncertainty in the position or the uncertainty in the, the momentum and say, what is the minimum uncertainty in the other one or something like that? It would just be a, a very you know basic plug and chug kind of situation. So uh, sometimes instead of giving you the momentum itself, they give you the velocity. And so your change in momentum is equal to the change in mv. Well, again, it's typically not the mass that's changing, and so you can take that mass out of the change part of it and make it mass times the change in velocity. And so sometimes I'll tell you what the change in the velocity is, and you need to multiply it by the mass of the particle you're talking about, which is usually an electron and usually something they have to provide you with. Uh, and then you can calculate that change in momentum, and then once you know the change in momentum, you could then figure out what the minimum and I shouldn't say change in momentum, uncertainty in momentum. Delta usually means change, but in this case, it means uncertainty in momentum. You could take that uncertainty in momentum and use it, use it to calculate the minimum uncertainty in that electron's position.
Now, if you found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a thumbs up? Best thing you can do to make sure YouTube shows this lesson to other students as well. And if you are looking for quizzes and chapter tests and practice final exams and a practice final exam rapid review, then check out my general chemistry master course at chadsprep.com. I'll leave a link in the description. Free trials available. Happy studying.